Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the governor is on a uh, White House call, so he will be joining us momentarily. I'm Mike Pichak. I'll kick off uh, with this week's uh, modeling and data presentation. Uh, we'll then hear from Secretary Dan French with a K through 12 update, Secretary Smith uh, with a vaccine update, uh, and then Dr. Levine. And of course, uh, when the governor arrives, uh, we'll hear from the governor as well. So starting this week uh, with Vermont's data, last week we saw some encouraging trends in terms of uh, case numbers, uh, in terms of uh, hospitalizations, uh, both in Vermont uh, and in New England and nationally. Uh, unfortunately, as it relates to Vermont, those trends have not continued. Uh, you can see here on the case slide that the trends have, con have actually reversed and gone up, uh, up about 26% uh, over the last seven days and up 8% over the last 14 days. We'll get to it in a minute, but the uh, trends in New England uh, and in the country have largely uh, held steady, which certainly is a good sign for Vermont. What happens around us obviously has an impact on us here in Vermont. Uh, but at the moment, as you can see, uh, the case slide uh, trends have uh, reversed and are going up. You can look at the modeling slide from last week. Uh, in that 50% confidence interval, uh, the cases have fallen on the upper end of that. So it was something the modeling was showing was a possibility, but again, all of the other trends uh, were pointing uh, in a favorable direction. Um, and uh, we're not anticipating that reversal when you consider uh, that cases had been coming down for two weeks in Vermont. Uh, and I, like I said, that cases have started to drop uh, in New England uh, as well. So again, something we'll have to keep a, a close eye on. Uh, at the moment, uh, in terms of the modeling, uh, both because of the um, uh, state holidays that we were experiencing uh, and also uh, because of the trends in Vermont, a little uncertain as to the direction uh, that we're heading, uh, unfortunately. Uh, when you look across the country, you see that Vermont had the 19th fewest cases reported in the last seven days on a per capita basis. So continue to be in that sort of top uh, performing uh, half of states, but um, you can see there uh, that we are at 19. Uh, when you look at the vaccinated versus unvaccinated rate, a similar story holds true here. You can see how much different that fully vaccinated rate is uh, than the not fully vaccinated rate. That fully vaccinated rate has continued to stay pretty steady. It's increasing about 7% over the last seven days uh, while that um, uh, not fully vaccinated uh, rate is up about 7% as well. Uh, but again, that difference is held pretty steady there, about 3.9 times greater among those who are uh, not fully vaccinated. You can see on the next slide that uh, tests have had held steady over the last number of weeks. So this fluctuation that we're seeing in cases, uh, not really tied to a fluctuation in the amount of testing that we're doing. Uh, last week, we had uh, cases go down when our testing numbers actually went up a bit compared to the week before. Uh, this week, testing is up again a little bit, uh, cases up as well. Uh, but generally, testing has held pretty steady. Uh, it just looks like the prevalence of cases is a little higher uh, in Vermont this week compared to last week. When you look at where the cases are, uh, similar trends hold here as well. The Northeast Kingdom continues to be uh, at the upper end of the regions of Vermont with case counts. You can see them clearly standing out over the last few weeks, but including this week, uh, standing out as one of the highest uh, case prevalence regions. Uh, central or Southern Vermont, rather, uh, holding pretty steady, while the Chittenden County area and uh, Central Vermont uh, coming up just a little bit as well. So cases in Southern Vermont holding steady, still very high uh, in the Northeast Kingdom relative to the rest uh, of Vermont. Looking at the hospitalization rates, uh, this was something, again, that gave us encouragement last week. We saw the admissions going down, uh, particularly among those uh, 70 and older. Uh, those admissions have continued to trend down, so the number of people being admitted has been trending down recently. Uh, we'll just put a pin in that for a second about something we want to talk about. But when you look at the hospitalization rates overall, uh, still a majority of them among the not fully vaccinated. So 69% of recent hospitalizations among those who are not fully vaccinated, 82% of uh, ICU stays among those who are not fully vaccinated. Uh, you can see again, when you look at the rest of the country, Vermont uh, performing at the top in terms of the number of new admissions, sixth in the country this week uh, relative to uh, all the other states in the country. Uh, again, when you look at the fully vaccinated versus not fully vaccinated on the admission side, you see that the admissions have come down more clearly for those who are fully vaccinated versus those who are not. Uh, the fully vaccinated admission rate has gone down, but that's down about 6% compared to those who are fully vaccinated, down 36% uh, over the last seven days. 
So we mentioned that the 70-year-old age group was coming down, uh, which certainly is a good thing, but something that we want to just keep an eye on and have a note of caution is when we look at the different age groups and the cases that we're seeing, you can see that the 70-year-olds and the 80-year-olds and over did see their cases go up this week as well. Uh, so again, for those who are visiting, uh, maybe elderly friends or family, uh, be cautious, take a test before you see them. Uh, those that are eligible for boosters, uh, certainly important to do that and get boosted uh, or even get your initial vaccine as well. We're seeing a big disparity among the rates uh, of cases, hospitalizations and deaths among those who are fully vaccinated and those who are not fully vaccinated in those elderly uh, Vermonter populations. So really critical uh, to get vaccinated, but critical to get your booster shot as well. Turning to the Vermont uh, death slides, you can see that we are at 14 deaths for the month of October. Uh, we are at 45 deaths for the month of September. A few deaths reported recently uh, were actually uh, occurred in the month of September. Looking at the next slide, you'll see that that fortunately puts us at the better end of the spectrum in terms of the other states across the country. Uh, but with the case rates as they are, uh, a little uncertain, uh, any forecast in terms of the trajectory that we're heading uh, in terms of our fatalities is also uncertain uh, at the moment, uh, unfortunately. But we'll keep, obviously, a close eye on those uh, as the week uh, and weeks unfold. Looking at higher education, uh, it's continue to be good news on college campuses. You can see that we had 27 cases this week, up a little bit from last week, uh, but pretty steady throughout the entire uh, semester. Uh, their vaccination rate has broken over 95% uh, in terms of all institutions together. So the news continues to be favorable on our college campuses. Looking at the long-term care facility outbreaks, uh, you'll see that we added one additional outbreak in terms of the total number. Uh, there are actually four outbreaks that were uh, retired from the slide, five new outbreaks that were added. Um, and you can see that the total number of cases down a bit from last week, down 17 compared to last week. Uh, so again, maybe some favorable signs there. Uh, in terms of the long-term care facility outbreaks. In terms of where we're still seeing optimistic uh, trends, uh, certainly across the country, you see here that cases, hospitalizations, and deaths for this week have continued to trend down. When we look at the next slide, which breaks that out by the most vaccinated states and the least vaccinated states, you continue to see that big difference. The states that are more vaccinated, like Vermont, uh, continue to be uh, spared the worst of this Delta wave. Uh, our cases are not nearly as high as those that are less vaccinated, even though they're starting to see improvement and have been improving for a number of weeks. And then when you see Vermont in there specifically, you can see we're a little higher on the case counts, uh, but continue to remain uh, right on point in terms of the number of fatalities and hospitalizations remain low uh, relative to our peers in that highly vaccinated rate. Similarly, when you look at the New England trends, and this goes through last Friday, uh, because there were a lot of reporting delays over the weekend, so we didn't include the weekend in these numbers. But when you go through last Friday, you can see that most of the New England states have a clear trajectory downward at this point. Even Maine had had a lot of trouble uh, in the last you know, number of weeks, including pretty much most of the Delta wave, uh, has started to see their cases come down. Uh, same with uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Uh, New Hampshire is pretty flat, and you see Vermont in there as being the outlier uh, with cases increasing this week. Turning to vaccinations, we see that uh, they have picked up a bit. Uh, similarly to some of the states not reporting, the CDC did not report uh, yesterday or on Sunday. Uh, so this is a truncated week. Uh, but even that being the case, we're still up about 2,400 new individuals starting vaccination this week, which is certainly a good sign, up to 88.7% of eligible Vermonters who have uh, started vaccination. And you can see that the seven-day average has jumped up a bit as a result, up about 35.8% uh, over the last seven days. So. Good to see people continuing to get vaccinated. Important to get your booster shot if you're eligible, but important also to get vaccinated if you're still on the fence. Uh, important to do so as quickly as you can. And that leads us to where we stand in terms of vaccination rates overall. You can see that there hasn't been any change from last week. Uh, most importantly, uh, we are the um, number one state in terms of the population fully vaccinated, now over 70% of our entire population uh, is fully vaccinated in Vermont, the first state to get to 70%, um, but also at near the top or at the top uh, of many of these other rankings as well. So with that, um, I'll turn it now over to uh, Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good afternoon. A uh, major focus of our work um, last week has been to support the rollout of our new uh, test-to-stay program. 
I've been working with school districts to develop a better understanding of how the system will work uh, and to start to address uh, many of the logistical considerations uh, that are coming up. Uh, test to stay will be a promising solution uh, to try to minimize the spread of schools uh, while at the same time uh, doing a better job of keeping our students in school. Uh, that being said, there's still a lot of moving parts uh, for implementing test to stay. Uh, met with the leadership of the School Nurses Association last week, and it was one of the points they wanted me to emphasize uh, that will take some time to implement test to stay. Not all districts will be able to move forward as quickly as others. Um, and parents and students should be patient as we work through uh, the logistical issues to implement the program. I will be meeting regularly with the leadership of the School Nurses Association going forward. Uh, last year, uh, they met regularly with the health department team and their feedback was funneled up through our decision-making process from the health department. Um, as a result of the meeting we had last week, uh, we decided to create a new structure and I will meet with them bi-monthly along with leaders from the health department. Um, and I think that'll be a more useful structure to get their input factored more directly into our decision-making. Um, the Nurses Association did hold a webinar last week on test to stay. Uh, featured speakers included Dr. Bell from the Vermont chapter of American uh, Pediatrics, uh, Ben Lee, uh, Dr. Ben Lee at UVM, a school nurse uh, from Lexington Public Schools in Massachusetts, and uh, some of our team at the AOE. Um, we also followed up, had an additional webinar on Friday uh, that overviewed uh, test to stay in the context of all our other uh, testing initiatives and started to outline uh, the various processes that school districts would need to do to on-ramp uh, into test to stay. Um, thought I'd summarize two of the processes uh, that districts are working on right now. One is the CLIA waiver process, and the other is uh, specific training on some of the antigen tests that are part of the test to stay program. Uh, one manufacturer in particular, Abbott Labs, uh, requires testing for all the testing sites that use their Binax Now test. Um, the CLIA waiver uh, process is basically required because it's necessary for schools, uh, any, any site that's going to implement medical testing, and the waiver process is available under federal regulation when the tests that are being administered are fairly simple um, and there's a low probability of erroneous results from the test. Uh, so we're working on school districts to get them through that process as of this morning. We've had four independent schools and 26 school districts, or about half our school districts. Uh, begin the CLIA waiver process. Uh, four independent schools have obtained their CLIA waivers and eight school districts have done so. Uh, we're encouraging all independent schools and school districts to begin the CLIA waiver process, whether or not they feel like they're ready to implement test to stay at the moment, just to, to accomplish that uh, piece of paperwork, get it out of the way. Um, in terms of training, uh, Abbott Labs uh, held one training session on Binax Now last Wednesday. Uh, we had 35 participants, and we've scheduled uh, additional trainings going forward on every Monday and Tuesday uh, for the next two weeks, and we'll schedule additional trainings as necessary. Um, we're also working on a simplified parent consent form and process. Uh, this form will cover our response testing and the use of the antigen tests that are part of the test to stay program. Um, we do continue to hear from districts and from the school nurses about staffing concerns. Um, I don't have any easy solutions to that, as I mentioned previously, but we are working to uh, take some things off the plate, so to speak. Uh, one area for improvement we're looking at is contact tracing. Contact tracing is a labor-intensive process, uh, but when paired with the antigen testing uh, for close contacts, it is a powerful tool uh, that has been shown in other states uh, to keep kids safe and keep them also in school. We know uh, from data from the UK and Massachusetts uh, that classmate contacts have a low likelihood of becoming cases. Uh, from an educational perspective, we need to use the contact tracing process in conjunction with the antigen testing uh, to minimize the number of stu students that are excluded from school. So our immediate priority for supporting the implementation of test to stay is to make some revisions to the contact tracing process. We're reaching out to our various stakeholder groups uh, to see how we can make the process more doable while also protecting our students. Uh, making contact tracing more manageable can create more capacity to implement test to stay. I'm not only concerned about the amount of time involved in contact tracing, but also the amount of conflict it's creating uh, for schools and their families. Uh, families experience significant disruption uh, to their routines when students are placed in quarantine. Some students are, or excuse me, some parents are pushing back or not adhering to the quarantine instructions from schools. It's something I've observed lately when I've been in schools that uh, nurses routinely mention this conflict. Uh, it's persistent and it's wearing on school staff as much as it is wearing on parents as well. 
Um, schools are not designed to work in conflict with their parents uh, and their communities. Uh, the educational process is a partnership. Um, so I'm hopeful uh, test to stay will not only be efficient and effective, uh, but also lead to less conflict in our communities uh, since it enables more students to stay in school uh, full time. Again, this will take some time to implement, but I encourage parents uh, and families to work together with their schools during this very challenging moment. Um, I think we have identified a good solution in test to stay and we're working in partnership with our schools to make it as easy as possible to implement, but it will take some time. Um, that concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French. Good morning, everyone. As of this morning, over 29,000 people have gotten a Pfizer COVID-19 booster or their additional dose of a vaccine. In terms of any new boosters, both the FDA and the CDC must approve these. On Thursday this week and Friday of this week, the FDA's advisory committee is holding meetings to discuss the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson boosters for those 18 years and older. They'll also discuss the possibility that an individual could get a booster dose that is a, of a different type from that of their original vaccine. The following week, the CDC panel will meet to discuss the FDA's recommendation. The CDC has final approval on all recommendations. On October 26, the FDA panel will meet again, this time to discuss the Pfizer vaccine for children ages 5 to 11 years old. Then on November 2nd and 3rd, a CDC panel will discuss approval of the FDA's recommendation regarding children ages 5 to 11. As these approvals come through, we have the capacity to roll out boosters. While we already have the capacity to vaccinate children 5 to 11, the pace of the rollout will be determined based on the availability of child-specific vaccine. As was the case with the vaccine when, when we first was first authorized, all of this will be done through our network of vaccine clinics, pharmacies, schools, and healthcare uh, partners. But with children, pediatricians will play an important role as well. And we are rolling out boosters to all eligible groups at the same time. There'll be no segmenting of, uh, of the rollout. It'll be all at the same time. As I mentioned last week, Vermont is being as inclusive as possible in our definition of who is eligible for a booster. So please take any opportunity that becomes available to you and your family to increase your protection against COVID-19. As the governor has mentioned many times, COVID-19 is a pandemic that will eventually become an endemic that we must all manage together. That means Vermonters will have to take personal responsibility and take the preventive steps needed to stay healthy. On a daily basis, we see data showing that up to 75% of Vermont's reported positive cases are among unvaccinated individuals. Predominantly, these are people who can get vaccinated and have chosen not to be and subsequently caught uh, COVID-19. To protect yourself, your family, and your friends, I encourage you to get vaccinated. This week, there are more than 70 state-run vaccination clinics available. You can also visit most pharmacies and healthcare providers to get vaccinated. Whether you need the initial vaccine or you're ready for your booster, please make an appointment to get vaccinated. Uh, visit www healthvermont.gov slash my vaccine. You can also call 855-722-7878. Lastly, I'll turn to testing for COVID-19. As Commissioner Pichek has, has mentioned, we have a very robust testing uh, regimen in this state. Over the past seven days, we've processed approximately 47,000 tests. Testing is free and easy. And you can find these testing locations and make appointments by going to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you. And as Commissioner Pichak noted, cases are falling nationally, but in Vermont, we have not seen that happen in a consistent manner still. The super contagious Delta variant continues to find ways to spread throughout our communities, especially among people who are not vaccinated, including children. 70 to 75% of all recent cases are among people who are not vaccinated. We continue to see cases across the whole spectrum of settings, from schools and child cares to long-term care facilities and workplaces. The majority of these cases are related to community transmission and are not associated with outbreaks. This spread is, of course, not what we want to see, but we are still using many tools to protect Vermonters during this pandemic. Some are the same, and some have changed as the pandemic has evolved. Testing, for example, continues to be key to finding cases, isolating them, informing them and their close contacts, and stopping further spread. It's still available and free throughout the state, and I very much appreciate Vermonters stepping up and utilizing this tool to the tune of six to 7,000 tests per day. But in schools, as you've heard, we focused on deploying newer rapid testing, test to stay, to get results faster while also keeping kids in school. This is how we balance our need to keep communities safe with finding ways to safely live with the virus. And I do expect that we will have a national strategy in the not too distant future where the use of at home, rapid, accurate, and free or inexpensive testing may become the norm and help guide us in our daily activities. <clears throat> As you know, we still hold vaccination clinics around the state. With so many people already vaccinated, numbers go up slowly, but we add to our vaccinated ranks on a regular basis. We've actually vaccinated over 40,000 Vermonters since restrictions were lifted in June, predating, but also likely with the help of policies such as required vaccines for employees. We're also working hard to ensure Vermonters have the most protection possible against COVID by getting them their booster shot. Many Vermonters who receive Pfizer are eligible now, and many more who receive Moderna and Johnson & Johnson will be soon as federal regulators meet later this week, as you heard. <clears throat> Based on their guidance, I encourage Vermonters to get that dose of added protection as soon as they can. And the long-awaited news regarding a mix and match approach may be forthcoming, and we can expect that data from trials of this approach will be analyzed and debated. We'll keep you up to date as that unfolds on the federal committee level. Now, since I was not here last week to do so, I do want to address the CDC's recent and urgent health advisory regarding vaccination and pregnancy. In light of the 22 deaths from COVID-19 that occurred nationally in pregnant women in August. The CDC health advisory strongly recommends COVID-19 vaccination either before or during pregnancy because the benefits of vaccination for both pregnant people and their fetus or infant outweigh known or potential risks. Pregnant people with COVID-19 are at increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes that could include preterm birth, stillbirth, and admission into the neonatal ICU who, of the newborn also infected with COVID, as well as increased risk for the symptomatic mother of death or ICU admission. And finally, we are preparing for the approval of vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. This will be significant development in our efforts against the virus. I've heard from parents and caregivers who are very eager to have their younger children vaccinated, but I also know many will have questions. That's okay. I'm a parent and now a grandparent, and I understand. As we get more data, we'll be able to provide fuller answers for you. If you're the parent of a young child, I hope you'll reach out to your pediatrician for the answers you need. I'm confident they will be reaching out to you, either individually or as part of a broader informational effort. 
Just like for adults, vaccinated children have less of a chance of getting sick with COVID, of worrying about rare but serious complications, or having long-term effects from COVID. The vaccine can keep them safe, protect those around them, and help them live their lives without the disease. We're fortunate that COVID is now another vaccine-preventable disease, and that makes this a winnable battle. <clears throat> I'd like to turn for a moment to COVID-19 treatments. Vaccination is still the most important way we greatly reduce the chances of getting severely ill. But people who get COVID and are at higher risk should consider asking their health care provider for monoclonal antibody treatment. These have been shown to meaningfully reduce the incidence of hospitalization and death in those with COVID-19 who are at risk for severe disease. Monoclonal antibodies are recommended for COVID patients with mild to moderate disease, so they are not hospitalized or on supplemental oxygen, and are age 65 or older, or with a medical condition such as obesity, diabetes, smoking, heart and lung disease, and other chronic medical conditions. And of course, those whose immune systems may not have amounted an adequate response to the vaccine. If you do get COVID and have any of these risk factors, tell your healthcare provider you are ill and ask to be evaluated for monoclonal antibody treatment. This is especially important if you develop shortness of breath. Treatment usually requires referral to an infusion center as the drug is given intravenously. However, now it may also be given as a needle under the skin. While there may be mild side effects, no serious adverse effects seem to occur with any frequency. When used early enough, this treatment can reduce the number of people becoming hospitalized by 70% and reduce how long symptoms last by three to four days. This is not meant for people who are already hospitalized, as we have another, a number of other treatments that are more appropriate in that setting. <clears throat> and please remember, vaccination is still your best approach to minimizing the chance of getting severely ill in the first place, even when we have treatment options like monoclonal antibodies and antiviral medications. This is a lot of information today, but I'd like to remind anyone who has a positive COVID test that they can also get a free pulse oximeter from the health department. This small device clips onto your finger and measures your pulse and oxygen levels and can help you assess how ill you are or if your illness is getting worse. It's especially important to identify this in the first five days of illness when the antibody treatment can be most effective. You may also have heard of a new antiviral pill that could treat mild to moderate illness in higher risk adults, Molnupiravar. The pharmaceutical company Merck has just submitted an emergency use authorization request to the FDA. A clinical trial showed an approximate 50% reduction in the risk of hospitalization or death. And if this is true, it could be yet another important tool along with vaccination to managing this pandemic. For the same group of adults that have been shown to benefit from monoclonal antibody treatment, but as a pill, much more user-friendly. Stay tuned for more news from FDA and CDC in the coming weeks. <clears throat> Finally, it's October, which means it's time to get your flu shot. This month, please, COVID has shown us the incredible benefits of having a readily available vaccine for what can be a serious illness. There's no waiting period between your flu shot and a COVID vaccine or a COVID booster. It's even safe to get them at the same time, one in each arm, if you want to. It's important to stay as healthy as possible with both COVID and the flu potentially circulating this fall and winter so we can stay in school, keep working, 
and protect one another. Now the governor will make his comments. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and good afternoon. Apologies for the time change today. I'll be traveling to Washington, D.C. this afternoon with General Knight for meetings with our federal and international partners, and uh, we'll have more information on that uh, coming later this week. I'll be brief because we want to leave uh, time for you to ask as many questions as possible before I have to go. I, uh, I just got off our call uh, with the White House and other governors, and here's what we heard. Dr. Walensky, the CDC director, emphasized that while the national picture is looking better, they are not letting up on the importance of getting people vaccinated. That includes moving forward on FDA approval of boosters for Moderna and J&J, &J, as well as the emergency use authorization for kids 5 to 11. They still expect these to be taken up in the next few weeks, and like us, the federal government is already preparing for distribution of the vaccine once it is approved. Um, Dr. Walensky, as uh, Dr. Levine has just mentioned, uh, Dr. Walensky has urged people to get their flu shots because they expect this to be a more severe flu season after a mild one last year. And people don't have the antibodies uh, necessary to, to uh, ward this off. And she reiterated as well that it's safe to have a uh, flu shot and a booster at the same time. And finally, Governor Inslee from Washington asked about allowing Canadians to travel into the U.S. Um, simple answer uh, from the White House is, we're working on it. So uh, time will tell, but um, they did mention that uh, I had asked about this weeks ago. Next, I wanted to take a moment to express my appreciation for the work of parents staff and teachers through the first six weeks of the school year and i know it hasn't been easy after what kids went through last year we know how important it is for them to be in school especially with the isolation and the loss of learning they experienced so the fact that 80,000 kids are back five days a week is huge but it wouldn't be possible without the school staff nurses and covid coordinators working long hours their jobs are tough, and their commitment to students and their communities is unmatched. Unfortunately, we've heard where um, cooperation from some parents have been less than ideal. And I want to remind everyone that they're just doing their jobs under very difficult circumstances and conditions. So while I know this is tough on parents and students, please remember, this is not easy for anyone. So let's treat each other with respect and civility. It's our hope test to stay will lead to more kids being able to stay in school and less disruption for families. Instead of quarantines, students who are identified as close contacts will be able to go to school as long as they test negative each morning. As we've said, we've seen this work in Massachusetts and we believe it will be successful here as well. The Agency of Education will continue to work with districts on its implementation in the coming weeks. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. All right, we'll start with folks in the room. And just a reminder again, the governor has to leave in about 20 minutes. We'll try to get through as many people as possible. But uh, Secretary Smith volunteered to quarterback for the rest of the queue um, after the governor has to leave. So we'll start with Calvin. Um, you know, I, I guess. Governor, I mean, it, it, it seems that at this point in the pandemic here in Vermont, New England's doing well, cases are going back up here. I mean, why why has Delta been so hard to predict and why has it really taken Vermont by storm? Yeah, I mean, keep in mind, let's reset the clock a bit. We saw that our cases were coming down as well into last week. Then all of a sudden they went back up. We, I said, I think I said a week ago, uh, one day, two days, it doesn't make for a trend, and it didn't. Um, they went back up for whatever reason. I don't know. I wish I had the answer. I wish. I think we all wish we had the answer. Remember, we had been talking about the nine weeks. We thought we saw it in the U.K., we saw it in India, 
uh, where a nine week surge and all of a sudden a dramatic drop. And we thought we'd see that here in the US. The reality is um, what we're seeing in the south, uh, southern states and uh, other areas uh, in the west as well, uh, that it's more like 12 or 13. So we're not quite there yet. Um, we're expecting uh, that uh, we'll see that drop again. And uh, again, we saw a bit of a drop today, uh, but uh, one day does not make a trend. So we have to look at this over a longer period of time, seven day average, maybe even longer. Um, but, um, but again, unfortunate, we're disappointed, uh, wish we had all the answers, but we have to keep doing what we think is right. And that is getting more people vaccinated, protecting uh, those, protecting yourself, protecting those who are most vulnerable, uh, wearing a mask when you're inside in certain conditions, and, uh, and as well with the uh, kids in school wearing their mask as well. So the test to stay uh, program, we think uh, that will help in some respects. I heard uh, Governor Baker was talking about that on the call. Um, the Governor Brown from Oregon was having uh, some issues with their, uh, some of their mandates and some of their test to stay. They're trying to set it up. Uh, the uh, the um, White House has said they hope to have release some uh, guidance on that, but um, but as Governor Baker said, they've uh, they made it work in uh, in Massachusetts, and we're hoping to do the same here. Governor, can you speak a little more directly about what you mean about uh, cooperation from some parents is not ideal? What what aggravates you about that? Can tell, yeah. tell me what's is, is you know and. and I'm sure Secretary French can go into further detail, but again, this is frustrating for everyone. Um, they, uh, they're with the with the um, cases uh, that we're seeing in schools um, and the quarantining that is uh, necessary for some. Not knowing who should be quarantined, who should not, uh, leads to frustration, dis disruption uh, with uh, with families. And, uh, and work and so forth. So it's led to a lot of frustration uh, against those who are just trying to do their job. They're just trying to keep their kids uh, safe and, uh, and, and keep the schools open. So um, all I want people to do is just to take a step back and just understand everyone's doing the best they can under very, very difficult circumstances. Anything you wanna to add to that, Secretary Ranch? Yeah, I think, you know, Stuart, the, um, where we've seen sort of repeated issues where students are in quarantine and their education has been disrupted and obviously parents, it's, it's, it can be hard on most parents to uh, figure out childcare and so forth in those circumstances. Um, I've had nurses report that, uh, you know, students aren't necessarily supervised when they're sent home in quarantine, so there's concern about uh, to what extent students are actually staying in isolation when they're not in school. And you know, we still, I think our epidemiological team would say that although we do see transfer of cases inside a school, for the most part, cases are being brought from their communities into the school. So if we consider this idea of students going, you know, in quarantine or isolation, being sent back out into the locations that they obtained the virus, that it's, it's problematic. So I just, I've, it's a pattern I've noticed. It's something we wanted to highlight um, and just, you know, again, ask for people to work together. Um, I've heard it on several occasions now from nurses. It's contributing to their fatigue. Uh, it's not, uh, as one nurse told me, it's not what they signed up to be a nurse to be arguing with parents about uh, the need to comply. Uh, but again, it's, it's all about keeping our kids safe. So we just need everyone to, uh, you know, really work together. It's a very challenging uh, time with the Delta variant surge. Governor, is there anything that can be done to uh, help people who are to uh, confront this new rise in cases? And then separately, very quickly, is there any update on the pending arrival of the Afghan refugees? Um, take the second one first. No updates on the, uh, the arrival of the Afghan refugees. We still expect it to be uh, during this month, but, um, but we haven't received any, any new information. Um, we are continuing to do everything we think we can at this point uh, within reason, and, um, and again, I hope that um, as we're watching hospitalizations, um, rates, and, uh, and to some extent, the, the number of cases, um, we wanna make sure that we're mitigating, managing them as best we can. And, uh, 
we think we are um, without going too extreme. And uh, I think we're in a much different place than we were obviously uh, a year ago. And uh, with a number of businesses, I mean, you've seen it. We've seen uh, historic uh, numbers of, of visitors in some places. I think it was in Killington. They thought they had the, the biggest weekend they've had ever. So um, we're able to keep people coming to our state. Uh, the economy is still moving. Um, we're managing the, the cases and hospitalizations, and we're just going to have to watch the trends uh, and make sure that we are uh, going down in the right direction uh, in the coming weeks. As I said, we thought it was going to be nine weeks, um, but it looks like the, the U.S. trend is more like 12 to 13 weeks. So we should, we should see some improvements uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. What's your take on reopening the State House to the public this upcoming session? I know um, that maybe it seemed like a bit more of a certainty early in the summer, and I know that's an ongoing conversation, but how do you think this Delta wave affects that and people being able to go back into the people's house? Yeah, I think, uh, again, we're watching this, this trend, and uh, if we're right and, and if we're, we move in the same direction as, as other states that don't have uh, the mitigation measures we have uh, here in Vermont and in the Northeast, uh, that uh, if we follow suit, uh, it, sh it would appear uh, that we uh, would be able to uh, move back to something more normal with the legislative session. Uh, but this is uh, something the legislature has to deal with themselves, and uh, we'll assist them in any way we can uh, to make sure that we uh, uh, allow for spaces uh, so that they're they're safe as uh, as well. That's important. Um, we want to uh, get back to some sort of normal. I think everyone would agree. The uh, legislative sessions haven't been ideal. weren't ideal uh, this past session at all, and uh, we just need more people to be involved and to be heard. And uh, but they did the best they could under the circumstances. Do you see any connection between the increase in visitors from other parts of the country? During the during the peak season here, yeah, uh, and the increase that we're seeing in cases, you know, I I don't think so. Um, although there's you know the more activity there is, um, uh, the more spread there would be. Uh, what we've seen is that the cases seem to be um, focused on gatherings. Um, small, mid-sized gatherings, whether it be wedding receptions or <coughs> gatherings at homes and, and parties and so forth, um, not larger scale. And uh, for any uh, of you that, that watched the Red Sox last night uh, at uh, Fenway, I mean, it was a lot of people. The place was packed, and I didn't see many masks there, although outside, but very, very tight conditions, both of the marathon and so forth. So we'll watch their numbers over the next uh, week or so. And if, uh, if they don't see a uh, rise in case cases over because of all the activity there, then um, that proves a lot of things that we think are important. Outside is, is, is important. Um, but, um, but we're seeing those cases mostly in uh, inside, um, more s smaller, uh, mid-size uh, gatherings, and uh, that's what people have to pay attention to. Uh, don't put yourself in, in those positions. Wear a mask uh, when you're around people you don't know, uh, and uh, especially when you're inside in those tight, tight conditions. Um, when I see the EPI report on a nightly basis, I watch uh, the number of, of uh, out-of-state uh, COVID cases, and at most, uh, I would say, at the, the high point, maybe 10%. Um, so it's, I don't think that's driving it. Governor Vermont continues to average over a death a day. We're at 14 deaths already in October. Were those deaths preventable? Is there anything your administration could do to bring those numbers down? You know, those cases, um, and we'll hopefully provide more information on that in the, in the coming weeks. Um, many of those uh, cases, uh, while tragic, uh, had a lot of compromising conditions, uh, a lot of chronic conditions uh, attached to most every death. And, uh, and there are certain, many circumstances where 
those who are in hospice, for instance, uh, happen to have COVID as well. So it, um, it's still uh, yet to be determined. Uh, Dr. Levine uh, had talked about some of the treatments available. Uh, the monoclonal uh, treatment is something that uh, that they, the health uh, department has sent out at least one Han, maybe two Han, Hans uh, in advising uh, to utilize that. Uh, but that's uh, fairly intensive. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, but this new uh, new pill uh, that uh, that Merck has come out with, uh, an oral type of antiviral um, pill, uh, I think that's a game changer because that's easy, it's less expensive, and uh, easily um, uh, used uh, by, uh, by people. So we're learning every day uh, how we can mitigate this. We still uh, are, have the lowest per capita death, uh, deaths, number of deaths in the country. So we're still, we're still okay, but every death is tragic, and uh, if we could avoid it, we would. No mitigation measures you can see that would help the, those numbers? I'm not sure what we could do. Um, I might ask Dr. Levine if he wants to comment if there's anything that we're missing. Uh, but, uh, but I know our healthcare professionals are doing the best they can uh, under these circumstances. But it does, uh, it does seem to affect uh, the elderly, the more compromised, as has been from the beginning. Um, I'm anecdotally, I would say. Uh, the, the vaccine hasn't been as effective uh, in preventing the deaths with the variant as we had hoped. Yeah, it's hard for me to add too much to that. Uh, I think probably everyone in the country would agree if we had a total lockdown, we would prevent deaths. There's absolutely no question. Um, doesn't mean deaths are tolerable, but at the same time, uh, I do think a total lockdown for much of the population, never mind Vermont, but anywhere in the country, uh, would be intolerable for many. Um, and uh, that's a very different circumstance. We had that circumstance in the very first couple of months of the pandemic uh, when nobody had any immunity at all and there was no option of vaccination. <clears throat> now, um, the population, uh, as was referred to with Fenway Park, people are making their choices about the kinds of exposures they're willing to tolerate and the kinds of exposures they aren't willing to tolerate. And that's very important to respect that uh, as long as people are using good recommendations and uh, choosing wisely, so to speak, and recognizing those amongst them that they should be trying to protect if they live with someone who's immunocompromised, elderly, or visit one commonly. So those are kinds of the issues there. Um, our guidance remains the same, um, and it has been successful, as the governor was pointing out, even though uh, a death is clearly tragic, uh, at many times it is not avoidable. And for years upon years, we've seen the same circumstance with influenza. Uh, we have vaccines for influenza, we try to keep influenza out of school classrooms, out of long-term care facilities, et cetera. But at the end of a season, there are always deaths that we can attribute to influenza in our most vulnerable citizens. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. Uh, with rare exception, most of the deaths that we've been seeing have been uh, in our most vulnerable citizens. Um, and that's tragic, but un unfortunately, when you're in a pandemic of this intensity, it's real. The other point I wanted to quickly make out uh, regarding uh, the recent cases and in increase, there are, when you look at graphs from India, from um, the UK, from the South in, in our country, you see these very steep going upwards. And then when the time comes, they start to come down. But the Northeast is very different than that. The Northeast has been a very subtle increase, um, as illustrated here. And it's not one of these up and down things. It's such a heavily vaccinated region that we're seeing the impact of the vaccine on much of the population. But we're also seeing that it drags out the kind of course that all the states have been having. 
and it's a much flatter curve. So you stay in a sort of plateau kind of fashion for a longer period of time, and you're not going to see that abrupt, steep drop down. And that's kind of what these curves are illustrating. I th also, you'd asked about what more could we do. I think what we're seeing, again, with those elderly, uh, more vulnerable, with compromised conditions, uh, they should get their booster. Um, because w when I say that the, the, um, the vaccine hasn't been as effective with the Delta variant, uh, the efficacy uh, has been waning a bit. So that's why they uh, have suggested the booster. I think the healthcare experts would say, get your booster. Uh, if you're in that position, if you're in that category, it's even more important. Governor, we've now had three incidents at high school athletic contests in which ugliness, uh, you know, racial uh, uh, taunting, transphobic, you know. Do you think teams should walk off if they're subjected to that? Do you, yeah. What should the response yeah. be? I, I mean, I, I think we have to come up with a response, a uniform response uh, to this. Um, and uh, we'll have to, 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 I think, the Agency of Education, uh, as well as the VPA and others, uh, need to get together and figure out what are we going to do when this, uh, we can't tolerate this. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't something that uh, the kids should be subjected to. Uh, and we should, we should stop it in its tracks uh, when it happens. Um, having said that, I just want to make sure that we're not encouraging um, that type of behavior to, to throw a game, so to speak. I mean, we, we just have to be careful on how we implement this and make sure it's the right solution. All right, we'll switch over to the phone, starting with Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Commissioner Pichek, um, it uh, appeared today that uh, you did not use the term unvaccinated in your presentation and charts. Instead, um, I saw, I think it was eligible Vermonters still to be vaccinated. And uh, I'm just wondering if, uh, if that's uh, some semantics or if that's a, a new way you're going to start listing people uh, or what? Yeah, so Mike, this chart hasn't changed since May, I think, of this year. We've used the same language as far as I can remember. The other time when we use breakthrough data, we refer to it as uh, fully vaccinated and not fully vaccinated because that's the way, uh, that's the most concrete data that we have available to us. So, you know, when we're looking at um, the breakthrough cases, that's how we look at it. Those that are fully vaccinated, uh, those who are not fully vaccinated, including those who are eligible and those who are not eligible. Uh, when we look at that one slide where we're tracking vaccinations, uh, we also include the number of people who are eligible but not yet vaccinated. So um, that really hasn't changed for some time. It just seemed that uh, Secretary Smith and Commissioner Levine d did, in fact, use the words unvaccinated as opposed to the chart that says eligible Vermonters. And I wasn't sure what the distinction was, but... Um, yeah. Dr. Levine, uh, you uh, answered one of the questions I was going to ask about uh, from a reader as to whether you, you can get your flu shot and uh, um, your booster at the same time. But somebody also had asked about whether it was uh, permissible when to get your shingles shot in relation to the flu and or the booster shot. Can you get a third shot at the same time? I would definitely not do that. <clears throat> uh, if, there is, if there is a vaccine that is associated with uh, people feeling more side effects, uh, it is the shingles vaccine. So I would probably isolate that one out for a period of time from any of the others. Um, having said that, um, st still a good vaccine to get. Uh, it's just not one I would want to combine at the same time. Okay. And one other thing, during the, one of the recent news conferences, the question was raised about how Vermonters truly can tell if the numbers provided by the health department are in fact accurate. Uh, and they came after 
the disclosure in New York with the change of governors that there was actually 12 additional, 12,000 additional deaths. I'd like to revisit that truth testing question in Vermont. When the Vermont Health Department reports its numbers, like the number of people not getting their second shot, how sure are you about those numbers when you present them? And are you aware that your department apparently sends letters to people saying the state has no record of them getting their second shot, even when they may have gotten their second shot? So to take your second part first, not totally aware that that has happened, but be happy to hear individual cases where that has happened and we can investigate that. With regard to our comfort with the data, we get reports from our own internal system for those who have gone through state of Vermont sites. We get reports from the pharmacy system. We get to compare our reports to what the CDC reports say. So there's sort of like a built-in cross-checking, if you will, with that and reconciling, as we've said at various times during the pandemic, when data was reconciled, when there was a difference between those numbers. So I feel pretty comfortable about that and certainly feel very comfortable about deaths because with our small numbers, all of these deaths go through our medical examiner's office. The death certificates are always available and checked on. So the advantage of being in a smaller state with fortunately a smaller number of deaths per capita with COVID is that we really have a good handle on all of those. And they're all basically have eyes on them. So maybe a little harder to get things lost in the shuffle when you have a state like New York where New York City alone has so many millions of people living in it. Well, why would, and somebody shared a copy of the health department letter with me. Why would somebody who got both their shots at the same place within the specified time separation end up in the health department records as not having gotten their second shot? Again, how accurate are the records? How widespread is the problem? Yeah. Is there any way the department can track this misinformation? Yeah, I would have the same question you're asking, Mike, if that were true. So if I could get the information on the person, at least that you're aware of, we can do a sort of root cause analysis to figure out how that would have happened in the first place. I really can't answer your question otherwise. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'll be in touch on that. Just case in point, uh, in, in terms of the number of cases that was asked earlier about uh, the out-of-state cases, and what I see uh, mostly is out-of-state New York and New Hampshire. Uh, they come from bordering communities to get a test in Vermont because it's more accessible and, and maybe it's because it's free. I don't know what they do in the other states, to be honest with you. Um, but we count those. Uh, th those are counted in our daily case counts. So. We try and be accurate, and, and at times I, I wonder whether we should be including them because they just go back home after they get their tests, but that's a, a small point. Ann Wallace Allen, seven days. Hey, thank you. Um, Governor, I'm hearing from a lot of people who are um, feel strongly that there should be a stronger mask mandate still. They're saying with the CDC guidance being what it is, everyone should wear a mask in public indoor settings. They're asking why the health department doesn't strengthen its guidance just a little bit to use the, um, the same type of message, should wear a mask in indoor public settings. I think we do. Um, I think that is the guidance we've been giving. If, if you're in a, and this is my terminology, I'll let Dr. Levine answer this uh, for the health department, but, um, Again, if you're in a, in a situation uh, where there, you're in a gathering inside, uh, you should be wearing a mask. If you're going into, what we found is it's not going into the convenience store after getting gas. Uh, it's not going into certain situations for a small period of time uh, and uh, like going into a, um, uh, maybe a, a, a hardware store or something. That's not where we're seeing it. Uh, we're seeing it, uh, the cases in gatherings, uh, in barbecues and receptions and 
baby showers and so forth, that's where we're seeing most of the cases. So if you're in one of those situations, you should be wearing a mask. Um, Dr. Levine. Yes, thanks for the question, Ann. And of course, you picked the one day where I didn't give my usual paragraph of uh, guidance because uh, I had way too much else to cover today. But I've been very consistently standing up here recommending indoor masking in concert with the CDC. And when you go to our uh, website um, for prote uh, how to protect yourself, uh, it reiterates that guidance. Admittedly, it doesn't mandate it. Um, that's, a, that's a different kind of policy decision at a government level, but it certainly provides the recommendation that that be what you do indoors. Do you think a mandate would help reduce the, number, the infection rate in Vermont? You know, that's a real challenging question at this point in the pandemic. Um, lots of public health officials look at where we are now and look at the appetite for the population for things like mandates. Look at who would abide by a mandate, which would probably be the people who have already been vaccinated and are of strong health beliefs that they should follow this kind of guidance, and who would not abide by it which might be the people who you would want most to abide by it. Uh, so it's very challenging. When you look at data from prior in the pandemic, we know masking is effective. So there's no question about that, even though people seem to be newly raising that question again. When you look at mask mandates, whether it be in a country, in a state, or within counties of a state, prior to Delta, mask mandates were more effective as well. When you look at Delta, we don't have a lot of data, and we see this incredibly high level of community transmission that Delta has uh, had, which doesn't seem to respect state borders when it comes to states that um, have either no guidance about masking, recommend masking, or mandate masking. So it's a very challenging question to answer right now. Uh, would, would that be effective or not effective? And then you'd, of course, want to factor in the vaccination level and status of the various places you were comparing uh, to also see uh, how much of a role that played and if that was playing what I would suspect to be even a bigger role than the mandating or not of masks. So it's a, it's a great question to ask, uh, very challenging to answer. What is the cost of just having a mandate anyway, just in the event that it would it might catch some of the people who aren't vaccinated? No, I understood, and I, I can let the governor answer as he has in many weeks regarding um, that kind of a policy decision and what it would require in the state to actually accomplish that. Well, again, and to be clear, um, if you're unvaccinated and you're indoors, you should be wearing a mask. You should be wearing a mask. Now, I don't think my saying that or us mandating that is going to get one single person to wear a mask that doesn't want to wear a mask. The enforcement is the challenge. Compliance is the challenge. Um, we believe you should, under many circumstances, as I mentioned many times, be wearing a mask when you're indoors in certain gatherings. Um, but I don't believe that, uh, and I've said this, that a mask mandate is effective in this situation right now. I just don't think we get the compliance. And I think that we would take our eyes away and our focus away uh, from doing what we can uh, to, to get through this. Um, it would just create one more controversy. All right, thank you. Greg Lamro, the County Courier. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, just one question for you, and then I'll hold off until you're not here uh, to allow for some questions for other people. But um, you said that during your questioning with the White House, you were given essentially the answer of we're working on it when you asked about the border or somebody asked about the border. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? And can you tell us a little bit about what you've done to push that issue other than just 
submit a letter, you know, because quite frankly, people that are, li are living near the Canadian border don't want to just hear we're working on it. We want to hear more. We want to know what's really going on and why it's taking so long. Yeah, no, no, totally. Um, I can appreciate uh, that their sentiment. I feel the same way. Uh, we have almost daily uh, calls uh, when any anything we um, when we have a call with a with the White House, uh, we mention that we want to see the border open back up, along with at least nine other uh, governors. Governor Inslee from Washington was the one that br who brought it up today, asking pointedly, "When are we going to see?" the border opened up because they have a number of people that come into Washington state to shop. And, uh, uh, and the answer was literally what I said, we're working on it. And that was about it. Uh, we'll continue to push, but uh, we don't have any authority uh, over the border. We don't have any authority over the White House and their decision making. Uh, but uh, we're, as, we're as frustrated as anyone else uh, on this issue. Uh, because it seems as though with their, uh, they have, uh, they're they're actually better protected at this point uh, than we are in the states in Canada. Um, so I uh, fail to see where this would be an issue. And if we want to put a uh, the same type of vaccine requirement, uh, whatever testing requirement, whatever it is, uh, it seems as though we could do that. Um, they have mentioned. You know, you can fly in um, to, from another country as well as into, from Canada, but that's just for the affluent, and uh, that's not what we need. Uh, we need to open the border up uh, to allow for safe travel into our bordering states because they're part of our economy as well. Um, your, your weekly calls with the White House, have you specifically brought this up, or have you only brought it up in a letter? No, I brought it up. Yeah. In fact, they mentioned that uh, um, one, uh, the executive director from the National Governors Association today, after uh, Governor Inslee asked his question, mentioned again uh, that uh, we have been consistent, Vermont has been consistent in asking for this for weeks. So um, that was their, their term. Uh, thank you, Governor. And I'll hold off my other question for uh, Secretary you can, one of, one you can of, yeah, yeah you can go ahead and ask that because I am um, I don't want to miss my flight so I'm going to take off at this point in time and see you all next week secretary Smith are you going to answer all the rest of the questions today I'll take the governor okay. thank you very much thank you governor it's a tough world when the governor is gonna worry about his flight taking off without him <laughs> Greg did you uh, have uh, you have another question I, I do. Um, so I, I'm told that the Johnson & Johnson shot is only available in, in the next four weeks. It's only available in Bennington County and Orange County. And, and I'm hearing from people who, you know, are, are on the fence and, and maybe would, would get a vaccine if it was down to just one, uh, one shot, uh, as Johnson & Johnson is right now. Um, for anybody in Franklin County, that's that's a two-hour drive to Orange County. It's a three and a half to four-hour drive to Bennington County. I'm I'm wondering why you know that's not available to to people in other parts of the state. Yeah, Greg, I know that, and if Dr. Levine has any additional information, we are very limited with the amount of Johnson and Johnson that we have. We have been promised that Johnson & Johnson will start flowing in at some point here. But you, you've got to realize for months we haven't had a supply of Johnson & Johnson. We've been using whatever we've had in the warehouse. Where it's been deployed specifically, I'll have to follow up on with you on that. I am not aware that we have any sort of uh, other than need uh, where it's been deployed. But I'll, uh, I'll look into that, Greg, for you. But for for the fat past two or three, maybe in four months now, Johnson and Johnson has been really limited in supply in in this state. Moderna and Pfizer have been much more abundant as it as it comes in. But I'll follow up, Greg. Sure. And and to be specific, that was more of my question, not the supply, but uh, 
why is it available on a on a weekly basis uh, in those two counties and not in the other 12 counties? So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Leora, Vermont Digger. Uh, yes. So I wanted to ask about the wait time investigation, and I wanted to know for, for UVM and for basically all the hostels, it sounded like. And I wanted to know uh, where you guys are at with that, what's sort of coming out of it, and then if you've gotten a chance to look at uh, UVM Health Network's um, patient access plan and what they're proposing, they released it today, and what are your thoughts about that? You know, I, I have not read it in depth. I've just scanned it as I was walking into the press conference here, so I have not had an opportunity to to see it. I was sort of pre-briefed on it that it was uh, that it was coming out and some of the elements that were in it. I think one of the things I'll be looking for in that plan is investment in human infrastructure. I think it's really important as we're talking about access that we do invest in human infrastructure in two fundamental ways. We recruit and the most talented people that we can, especially in those specialty uh, areas where we need to um, uh, fill some gaps, if there are gaps out there. And secondly, and more importantly, I think, is how do we retain a workforce here? I think it, it, you know, money is one, one, only one aspect of that, you know, whether it's bonuses or, or retention bonuses or something along that line. The, the culture is, is another aspect of it and how you develop a culture where people want to stay in the profession and here in Vermont, I think, is very important. In terms of the um, study, um, it's, it's underway. Um, the investigation is underway. And, you know, I think if you look at it from a high level, I think one of the things that you sort of look at it from my perspective is at, at three different segments. First, what are the benchmarks that we are going to, um, to set to, to determine what are acceptable and unacceptable wait times? That's number one. Number two, who's not meeting those benchmarks? And then number three, why are they not meeting those benchmarks? And those are three fundamental questions that I want to see out of this investigation. And when you see those, then you can come up with recommendations of what to do. The, we're at the, the first step right now, setting benchmarks in terms of where we're going to be uh, in terms of what are acceptable, unacceptable benchmarks. And, and like I said, I hope to have uh, some recommendations for the legislature when they come back in January. So that's the progress report on that. Thank you. Joseph Gresser, Barton Chronicle. Joseph. All right, we'll move to Pete Hirschfeld, BPR. Thank you, Jason. Um, Dr. Levine, on September 15th, um, you told us that there had been five pediatric hospitalizations due to COVID-19 since Delta arrived in Vermont. Do you have an updated figure for us on that? I, I can tell you it's more than five, but I can't give you an exact number. Um, I, can, I can get back to you on that. I know that as of today, there are five hospitalizations currently. Of uh, pediatric patients? Pediatric patients. Um, are any of those in the ICU, to your knowledge? I don't know where they are, to be honest. Um, another question for you. Uh, I, I, I probably missed something, but the last time I recall you talking about monoclonal antibodies was around this time last year. Um, you were much less bullish at that point on their utility as an intervention. You were also concerned about um, limited uh, space in, in the uh, infusion centers where, where monoclonal antibodies are administered. And I'm hoping you can talk about 
Uh, what's changed in the intervening months to, to um, make you think that this is an appropriate treatment for Vermonters with uh, moderate or severe cases of COVID-19? Absolutely. It's the data and the science. Uh, so very originally, like you mentioned probably a year ago, uh, not only myself, but members of our uh, academic clinical community uh, had all reviewed what scant studies there were, and basically those studies were not compelling. And in fact, bodies like uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America and the NIH review panels uh, were not as um, high on these. Um, it was very reserved. And so there was a reluctance to start using them, especially because it was, I believe, a, still a pre-vaccine era, and it was very complicated having people who were COVID positive enter hospital environments to go to an infusion room uh, and have um, not only that room but and the staff, but the whole hospital um, <clears throat> be exposed to somebody with COVID. You recall that most people were delaying medical care because they didn't want to even go near a hospital, thinking that was not a safe place to be. Fortunately, it turned out to be one of the safest places to be in our whole society. So that was a year ago. Um, a lot has happened since then. And <clears throat> what's transpired is some very high quality and compelling studies that basically uh, make the case very strongly for the utility of these monoclonal antibodies in treatment. Some of the ones that were originally used are no longer effective, uh, but have been replaced by other combinations of monoclonal antibodies that have been recently studied and are effective. So uh, that's the reason for the, my, my enthusiasm, if I could use that word, for them. Uh, we have capacity in the state right now uh, probably to process 20 patients a day, and if uh, staffed up, could probably get to 30 patients a day across the state if, uh, if these uh, antibodies were requested and needed. All of the uh, hospitals, all of the physicians in the state have protocols, have uh, received health alert notifications from the health department, um, and it's just a matter of there hasn't been the demand to exceed those numbers that I've just mentioned. But certainly, the capability right now is there to deliver those. And in fact, people are getting monoclonal antibodies in the state of Vermont, just not at the rate that I was quoting. Thank you. Um, and then last question for, for uh, Secretary French. Uh, as it relates to test to stay, what's the soonest that we could see districts have the capacity to institute this program um, and then, you know, for people that it's going to be more difficult to get this in place, how long might it be before uh, kids have access to this? Yeah, Peter, I mean, last week I said about two weeks. I think we will see a couple uh, districts uh, start to move down that path within that time frame. I think the, 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 basically the rest of the month I think we'll see more come on. Uh, but it will, you know, it'll take some work at the local level to figure out how to situate uh, this tool in the context of the other, the other tools we have on the table. And as I mentioned, um, we're looking as our priority right now to really look at the contact tracing process. I think if we can uh, come up with some revisions to that process <clears throat> that would help test to stay, uh, be operationalized in more districts, I think we'll see more come on. But I, I, would, I would suggest that this month you'll see more districts uh, implementing test to stay. Thanks all. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Um, Dr. Levine, I just wanted to follow up on Mike Donahue just to understand, uh, sorry if I missed it clearly, um, people who are eligible to get a booster shot, uh, is it okay for them to schedule both the booster shot and a regular flu vaccination at the same time? Definitely so. And no, no chance of increased side effects by combining them? Um, so with the booster shots, if you got 
your first, obviously you've gotten your first and second dose of Pfizer and you're getting your booster shot. Um, the chance of side effects from that alone is no different than it was for the first two shots. So that, that is quite clear that there's no increase in side effects by getting the booster. The flu shot, you know, generally people tolerated quite well, may get very mild symptoms, um, generally much less than what we've seen with COVID vaccines. Uh, there's no evidence that the combination of the two uh, gives you a set of side effects that are much higher than one or the other. Okay, great. Thanks very much. That's all I got. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. I have no questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Aditi, Vermont Digger. No questions, thank you. Thank you. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Hello, have I successfully unmuted myself? You have. Okay, this is probably for Commissioner Pichek. At the September 21st press conference, Governor Scott promised updated data on long-term care facilities and who is most vulnerable. Has this information been published? And if it was referenced at the beginning of today's press conference, I apologize because I did not get any volume for the first seven or eight minutes. Lisa, just hold on. I think we're conferring who's going to answer that. Just a second. Thank you. So I think it was two press conferences ago I, I gave a presentation on the long-term care facilities. Um, and I did show some slides. Uh, the question that the Commissioner Pichak and I are not clear to the answer on is, uh, are those slides actually on the DFR website or not? Um, but we'll have to find out and figure that out. I can certainly get you those slides. I would appreciate that. It's hard to see slides if they are not, when they are behind you on the screen because of reflections. Yes. So when you do show slides, we can't see them. But if that data were available, we would appreciate it. We have, we have readers asking us for it. Absolutely. Tim McQuiston. That's Vermont. it for me, thanks. Oh, sorry, Lisa, thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. I, I don't want to get this wrong. Who is catching uh, COVID right now? Uh, I got. I just wasn't clear on who's, who's getting COVID right now. The unvaccinated. And the, the age groups, is it, is it um, across the board? I, I saw, I, I asked you this, Mike, because I, I saw a report that it was people under 18 that are the, the biggest group, and I just wanted to see yeah. the accuracy, check to see of that. Yeah, Tim, we have a chart on that, I think, and uh, I'll either let Commissioner Pichek, uh, I'll let Commissioner Pichek uh, describe the chart. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tim. And it's being shown right now, Tim, if you um, are watching, but it's also in our DFR slide deck as well as on the website. So you can see uh, in terms of the per capita case rates that the zero to nine year olds stand uh, head and shoulder uh, above the other age groups that we're um, measuring here. Um, you can see the next age group is the 30 to 39 year olds followed by the 10 to 19 year olds. So that age group that unfortunately has no access to the vaccine at the moment uh, is clearly head and shoulders the highest um, rate in terms, of, uh, in terms of age. The more vaccinated uh, Vermonters, those that are in their 80s and their 60s and their 70s, uh, their prevalence is lower uh, than all of the other uh, age groups. So I think that's really the key takeaway is those age groups that are the most vaccinated have the lowest prevalence rate. Uh, those that unfortunately don't have access to the vaccine are seeing the highest rates um, at the moment and historically through uh, much of the Delta wave as well. Okay, I'll, I'll run this slide then in the next report. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, the, the one thing that I do want to say to, though, Tim, is you look at the case counts each night. I mean, the, the people that can, that can't be vaccinated are only a portion, uh, uh, a portion of that larger group that can be vaccinated. 
and chooses not to, and they are the ones that are driving most of the COVID cases here. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Guy Page. All right, move to Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, Commissioner Levine. Oh, we got you, Guy. Uh, I'm, I'm here. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Levine, um, or, or whoever, um, how many of the 14 Vermont fatalities on the dashboard for October were fully vaccinated? That's, a, that's one of those uh, not on the top of my head uh, questions. I can tell you um, we have the data on most of them. There are some cases that are, uh, occur out of state and we, we don't have access to the data always on them. But there are, so there are, clearly, fully vac there are clearly fully vaccinated people in the group of 14. No question. Okay. Um, and is that something that, that uh, Ben or someone could, could get to me in the next day or so? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, also, um, is this the first time, if I, re if I read that data right, um, the rate of increase among the fully vaccinated was 7.1 over the last seven days, as opposed to 6.9, which I know is not a great difference, over the um, not fully vaccinated. Is this the first time that fully vaccinated Vermonters have tested at a higher per capita rate, have tested positive than the unvaccinated? The three of us are shaking our heads saying we think so. I mean, we can't be 100% confident of that, but we think so. How do you explain that? I mean, if, why, why would that be? I, I, I guess I try not to explain things that are 0.2% difference uh, because I'm not certain that there is a real difference. And I wouldn't want to blow that difference out of proportion. I, I would also want to refer you to our weekly update on our website because instead of just focusing on the 14 deaths, um, you'll be able to focus on the whole pandemic and look at vaccination and uh, not vaccination rates. I, I guess, Commissioner, I would think that the, the death rate is pretty important factor there about about uh, when examining the the impact of the of the pandemic. And I don't mean to be flippant or snarky about that. It just seems that that's a rather important data point. <laughs> No, it's, it's critical, absolutely. Uh, and I, again, have to reiterate, um, from the very beginning, we have a vaccine that is one of the most effective vaccines that's ever been developed. But even saying that, if it has a 90 or 95% chance of reducing the most severe outcomes in those who get vaccinated, and you have a state the size of Vermont with a huge vaccination rate, you are going to see people who are not in that 90 to 95% who did not have that benefit, even though the majority of the population will have that benefit. Um, that's just okay. the way the numbers work, unfortunately. And it turns out mm -hmm. when we sort of drill down into looking at who didn't have that benefit, it is the very vulnerable um, who might not have had that benefit with the flu vaccine or any other vaccine uh, at that time in their life. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you, good afternoon. Uh, any word on winter sports guidance? Um, I know the high school season is over a month away, but youth sports such as ice hockey uh, and where you have a majority of players under 12 is either underway or on the verge of starting in the next week or two. Secretary, just Frank. curious about that. 
Hi, this is Dan French. Um, we're still on track to produce some recommendations on winter sports uh, for this month. Uh, actually, Secretary Moore and I are meeting this afternoon on that. Um, safe to assume that. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, that's all. This is Secretary Moore. I would I would only add that the um, the guidance we've been providing to the recreational sports community is to take their cues. Um, from what's going on in schools and recommending that masks be worn for indoor sports um, so long as masks are being worn in school. And uh, again, that's in the form of a recommendation, not a requirement since there's no state of emergency? That is correct. Oh, okay. Uh, that's all for me today. Thank you. Aaron Patenko, Vermont Digger. Hi. Um, so I remember there was some tentative discussion of, um, you know, surveying schools to get a better understanding of how COVID has affected them this year, kind of similar to how there was a survey for schools last year. I was wondering if where that survey was and, um, you know, if you had any results yet to share with us. Secretary French. Yeah, hi, Aaron. Uh, we are planning on launching that survey this month. Uh, there's two parts to it, I think. You know, one is we want to measure the vaccination rates, uh, both of students and staff, and we also want to get an understanding of the patterns of attendance that have occurred since the opening of school. Uh, so it's been our plan to launch that uh, survey this month, and it's on track for us to do so. So we don't have any data yet. So you don't have, just to be clear, any idea yet of how many schools closed their doors or sent students to remote learning due to COVID in late August to September? We haven't, we haven't stood up a data collection to uh, quantify that yet. Would the survey answer that question? Yes. Okay. That's it for me. Thanks. Welcome. Michael Vermont Digger. Michael Doherty. This is Aaron. I, I believe Mike is off today. Yep. One last follow up I, to clarify. Thursday and Friday are Moderna and J and J booster FDA meetings. We don't expect an, an announcement that day, right? Or from CDC? CDC's no, the, ultimate. the CDC meetings the following week on, on that, if I've got it correctly. Yeah, Johnson & Johnson this week, they'll, they'll also discuss uh, booster dose that is a different type from the original. The following week, a CDC panel will meet uh, to discuss the FDA's recommendation and then on October 26th, they'll talk about five to 11 year olds. So maybe a week from Friday, we'll hear. Yeah. About the, boost, the, about, about the booster expansion. Yeah, Dr. Levine. The FDA will still make an announcement. And in fact, today's news, they're already talking about the data that the companies submitted to the FDA as if it were gospel and we accept it the way it is and approve the boosters. Uh, so we'll hear more. I, I also wanted to just take this chance to clarify five pediatric cases today, but three of them are actually um, at the Brattleboro retreat. Uh, so they were not actually sent to a hospital for uh, COVID specifically, though they have COVID. 